Right. So in Exodus chapter 20, of course, we have the famous passages of the, of the Ten Commandments. This is where we find one of the um, recordings of the Ten Commandments. Look at verse number 5 there. I'm going to focus on this this morning. Uh, verse number 5 says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Talking about graven images. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. And this is the phrase that we're we'll focusing on this morning. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And what we preach about this morning is generational blessings and generational cursings. The things that we do in this life can have a severe impact on future generations. And we're going to see this taught very clearly in many examples, as well as just written out very plainly, like the Bible says right here, in the Ten Commandments. Look, when you hate God, God's going to visit the iniquity that you've done on you and on your children for, for you know, th three and four generations to come. And this is for them that hate God, by the way. This isn't just for every single sin. And um, turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 20. See, the first thing we have to get through our heads is that sin always hurts other people than just yourself. When you're, when you're fighting against God, when you're breaking His commandments, when you're doing things, we have a tendency to think that, oh, it's just me. I, you know, I'm not impacting anybody else. It's, it's just this secret sin that I have that I want to do, and I don't see how this could possibly bother you know, anyone else or get anyone else in trouble or anything else like that. And I have just recently have preached on that subject in general. You know, we brought up Achan, how he saw and coveted the, the garments and the silver, and, um, and he took them for himself, even though they weren't supposed to take any of the spoil. They're supposed to destroy the city. And as a result of his sin, just his theft, right, his, his little piece of money that he wanted to get caused, I think, like 70,000 people to die. I forget the exact number, but it's a really, really, really high number like that, where his one sin had an impact on, on a lot of other people because the Spirit of God was departed from the children of Israel when they went forth in their next battle. And it caused tons of people to die just from that one person and what he did. Now, that's just sin in general can have that repercussions, but what we're seeing here in Exodus 20 is that, you know, God will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon their children for three and four generations onto their descendants. And... It's not that they're being held responsible for their, for their sin, right? So, I'm mean, going to put this in the right words because, it, you know, the children didn't do the sin that the parents did, right? They're not held responsible for the sins of their parents, but because of the actions of their parents, their parents have brought about a curse on their own family that has an impact. I mean, think about this, you know, the, the sins of, of an alcoholic father, right? Someone just goes out and just gets drunk. You know, it's not the kid's fault, but what's going to happen as a result? Well, as a result, in many cases, the child won't be cared for properly, maybe, you know, because the money's all being spent towards dad's booze. So they're not going to be clothed properly. They're not going to be fed properly. Maybe the child will get beaten severely as a result of dad's rage when he comes home drunk or whatever. You know, all these bad things happen as a result and impact other people negatively as a result of someone else's sin, right? It's, and it's not that the child's responsible for dad's sin, but bad things happen as a result of that sin. In. And this is what happens, and God's warning us. Basically, you know, people that hate God, their iniquity and all the sins that they get into as God haters is going to come back then down upon their own children right. and their descendants for three and four generations. Now, um, I had you turn to Leviticus chapter 20 because this is a great example in the Bible of the Canaanites, the people who are in the land of Israel before Israel came and, and conquered and took over and, and inherited that land. And this is an argument that a lot of atheists and a lot of people who don't understand, well, the, you know, hate the God of the Bible and say, you know, well, how can God, you know, say, you know, sanction the murder of little babies? 
Right? It's an argument that I've heard this so many times that, that God is a cruel God and a wicked God because when he sent in the children of Israel to take over the land, they had to destroy everybody, you know, man, beast, like everything out of some of these lands. And what they fail to realize, and this is why we're turning to Leviticus chapter 20, is the state or the condition of those lands. And as a result, of those parents doing all of these wicked sins, it spills over into, into their whole family and, and you know the, the judgment just has to come as a whole. Now, to give you an idea of what was going on in the land prior to the children of Israel coming and taking it, because see, it wasn't just, and, and there's this false concept out there that may be out there, for many people that, oh, well, God just loved this people and this is the best land. So he was just going to put them here and just say nuts to whoever else was there because I love this people and I'm going to put them there. That's not the way that God worked it out. He was doing multiple things simultaneously. So while he was lifting up the nation of Israel and giving them a blessing and giving them an inheritance, at the same time, he was bringing his judgment down upon an extremely wicked and vile and reprobate people. Leviticus chapter 20 is, is, has a lot of uh, crimes in here that God puts the death penalty on. We'll do a brief overview. I don't have any of this in my notes, but let's just... Um, let's just see here. So like verse number... Four, and if the people of the land do anyways hide their eyes from the man when he giveth of his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off. And all that go whoring after him commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. The verse before that, verse 3, and I will set my face uh, against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. This is child sacrifice that was going on. Okay, people were literally taking their children and passing them through fire, like burning their children as a live burnt sacrifice unto a false god of God Molech. Right. This is one, I mean, if that doesn't turn your stomach right away, I don't know what will. I mean, that is so d grotesque and disgusting that people could take their own children and just throw them away and burn them and, and you know, call that a sacrifice unto, unto you know, some false god. God doesn't require that of us. God doesn't demand it of us or expect it of us for us to murder our children in this way. But let's, let's keep going here. Verse number six talks about wizards and um, familiar spirits, you know, demons, basically. Um, verse nine talks about children, you know, people that are they're cursing their father or their mother, being put to death. Verse 10, uh, adultery. And then we get into to basically like kind of incestuous type of relationships. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, you know, that, I mean, that's just wickedness. Just, it, there's, so, there's so many things. Let's keep going. Verse 13, of course, homosexuality. If a man lies with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Um, if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. Verse 15, and if a man lie with a beast... I mean, you talk about disgusting and perverted. Like, everything else on his list is, get, is, is pretty bad. Where you just go into animals, I mean, you have, you have just no sense of right and wrong or anything like that. It, it's, you've so far gone deranged to think that there's anything right at all about, about committing that act with an animal. I mean, I don't know. I don't think... I mean, what, what's even lower than that? I mean, you got pedophilia and bestiality are probably on the same playing field. As far, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you say which one's worse? I mean, right. at least with, with, with an animal, you're not, you're not destroying an animal for life the way that, I mean, you are, but not the way that you are a human being. Right. So, I mean, I, I would put that probably at the bottom. But it, <laughs> go ahead, you know, with the toss-up. At that point, what does it even matter? Um, and verse 16, again, bestiality. So we look at all of these various things, and there's more, you know, I mean, it goes on and on, but we see how depraved these, these laws are, these giving, saying, hey, look, these people need to be put to death. And most of that stuff, even in today's society, it's not that difficult to see, yeah, the, you know, these people have done some wicked things. But um, 
The verse I wanted to point out here is in verse number 22. The Bible says, Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land whether I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out, and ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. So God's saying, look, they did all of this stuff. And you could read back further. It's not just Leviticus 20, but just go, you know, read the God's law, read what he's, he's given here, read this in context, and then you could see, oh, wait a minute, those people were doing all of these things. And when a nation's doing just, just, just sunken down so low into the mire of depravity that this nation had gotten to, God wipes them out. I mean, we see that over and over again. It's the same thing with Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, God rained fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't, he didn't go in to try to save them or try to fix things or get things right. He's done that with other cities. You know, with Nineveh, he sent in his prophet, telling them to repent, tell, you know, get right with God. You know, you need, and, and it worked. But there gets a point to where nations just get so far gone that he just says, there's nothing we could do here. And even with Noah and the flood, I mean, God caused a flood on the entire world just because the thought of, of man as wickedness, just, and you're, you know, there's, there's so much violence and things going on in the land at that time that he said, well, we're going to fix this right now. And there's only one way to do it. And just everything needs to be destroyed and basically start over. So <clears throat> the problem, though, is it's not, it's not God. God didn't make all these things to happen. God's not the one that told them to go and do these vile, wicked, reprobate things. God's the one who said, don't do these things. But they're the ones that have done it. They're the ones that have basically destroyed themselves. And the actions of the parents have brought that judgment down upon their own children, upon their own house, and upon their own family, upon their own community. It has repercussions. And when, when, that, you, know, when, when you know that there's a God, and there's a judgment of God that's going to come, you are putting your own life, not just your own life, but your family and everyone else in danger when you hate God and you're gonna and you're gonna fight against God in that way. Turn if you would to Romans chapter number five. Now I'm just gonna read this for you in Deuteronomy 24 because the Bible is very clear that. The children aren't responsible, even though they may end up receiving bad things, you know, cursings or whatever as a result of their parents' sin, they are not still held responsible for their parents' sin. Those are, those are just the consequences of their parents' actions will fall out on other people. Just like our own sin, consequences will impact other people that had nothing to do with your sin. It's just a result, an end result of what you've done. But you're not responsible for it. So Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. We have our own responsibility, you know, ourselves. And if you, if, you know, these kids in, in the land in Canaan or just the people in general, I mean, if they were living in this wicked society, if, if any of those people were saved, you know, they, if they had their faith on the Lord, they're justified. Right. You know, they're going to heaven. God's not holding them responsible for all those other sins, but in order to, to, to bring the judgment upon the land, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're going to be taken also. Now, I doubt that there even was anybody because normally what we see is you know when God brings forth this type of destruction in general, there's probably not not people who are saved there. If there are, God will will get them out of that trouble. But anyways, <laughs> I don't want to <coughs> make a big point on that because it's just it's just unknown. I mean we don't we have no way of knowing who was and who wasn't <coughs> in the land at that time. But um, <coughs> excuse me. This also ties in with the concept of <coughs> original sin, of who's responsible for the sins and what happens as a result. So Adam is, is another good example of repercussions falling out on other people who didn't, who weren't responsible like Adam was for sinning, yet the, the act, his actions 
essentially curse gen, you know, generations to come, like until Christ comes back, right? Until, uh, you know, for, forever, uh, physically speaking here. The result, the, what Adam did when he brought sin into the world, his sin had an impact on every generation following him. And that's significant, but it doesn't make us responsible. So some people will teach with original sin, um, you know, which is one of the reasons why they baptize babies and stuff is that, oh, well, they're, the baby's a sinner because Adam sinned. And we need to baptize them to wash them from that sin so that they won't, you know, if they die, they're not going to go to hell or something stupid like that. The whole concept doesn't even make any sense as if that water sprinkling is going to, like, eliminate their sin. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, obviously, we need to believe, and then we get baptized after we believe, but the baptism has nothing to do with our, with, with our salvation. But the fact that Adam had sinned, it brought death into the world. Prior to that, there, it wasn't there. And we have a sinful nature as a result of Adam's sin. So what he's passed on to us, one of our curses, is that now our flesh is going to drive us to sin. That is not the way that God made Adam, but that is what has been passed on as a result. God didn't make the world to have all these thorns and brambles and for the ground to, you know, to make it real difficult to, to cultivate crops and to make food and to do all this work and stuff. God made things much better. When God made it, it was perfect. When God made man, it was perfect. When God made woman, she was perfect. When God made everything that he made, it was perfect and good and right. And his plan was a certain way. But see, God gave us a free will. God gave us the ability to choose what we're going to do. And when God gave Adam and Eve that one rule to say, you know what, do whatever you want, eat of all these different plants, but you know what, just don't eat this tree right here. Knowledge of good and evil, don't, don't touch that one. Everything else, everything's fine. And what they do? They got deceived. They did it. And as a result, they were judged. Their, their spirit died in that day. But they also then brought cursing upon the ground, upon the land, upon e, upon women in general. In sorrow, they're going to conceive and bring forth their children. Right? That's not the way that God had intended it from the beginning. But as a result of their sin, now this is passed on to generations followed. Does that mean women today are responsible for Eve's sin? No, not at all. But it is an impact. It's a result of something that she did. It's, 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 it's a repercussion of, of her actions. Amen. Now, Romans chapter 5 explains this very perfectly. And see, we're not judged because of, Adam, because of what Adam did. God doesn't judge us for that. But because of what Adam did, now we're stuck with these sinful bodies. You know, we, we've got this desire now naturally to sin that, that we didn't have before. Verse number 12 of Romans chapter 5. We'll go through this real briefly. By words, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And this explains very clearly, verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So basically what he's saying is that, you know, death passed upon all men. Adam brought that death into the world, but the reason why death passed upon all men is because all have sinned. Now, even though there are people that didn't sin after the same exact way that Adam did, it says that in verse 14, you know, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So you don't have to do the same sin that Adam did, and we're definitely not held responsible for his sin, but he brought that death into the world to begin with, and now we have to deal with it as a result. Now, uh, you can think of another example. You know, people want to try to argue against your faith, argue against the Bible, and, and just on how people get saved in general. You know, people don't like to hear the exclusiveness of Jesus Christ, how that you have to have faith in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And, and the importance of preaching the gospel to every creature, because if, if someone doesn't, you know, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, they say, well, what if someone doesn't hear? What's God going to do then? Are they going to go to hell? Well, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's a real simple uh, 
problem or dilemma, if you will, to deal with court with Scripture because it's very clear that your faith has to be in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved and go to heaven. So anybody who dies and that's not the case, they have their own sins. They, every, you know, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. They have their sins that they have to deal with and if, you're not, if, it's, if your faith isn't in Christ, there's only one place that you're going to go. So, <clears throat> this example, because people want to bring up these examples, right? These hypotheticals. Well, what about the person who lives in a jungle, and it's always in Africa, right? So there's a jungle in Africa where they just never heard Jesus. Not once in their entire life. You know, well, what happens to that person? You know, God can't, God can't send them to hell. I mean, they didn't even hear. They didn't even know. Well, the Bible says that God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, right. that it's our job to reconcile the world unto God. So, it's, again, it's not God's job to, to get that person the, the gospel. It's our job to get that person the gospel. If they die and go to hell without ever hearing, that's our failure, not God's. But it doesn't change what the scripture says and, and what reality actually is. Right. See, a lot of people want to think, because it's a horrible thought. I mean, it is a horrible thought to think of somebody dying and going to hell and they never even heard the gospel. That's a horrible thought. Right. I, I mean, it's not pleasant at all. I don't want to, you, know, you don't like to think about that. But you know what it is? It's reality. And that's one of the driving factors that says that we have to go. And these people that want to teach, and I've heard this before, well, maybe God just gives those people one last chance. You know, they've died, and then they get a chance to, you know, receive Christ. Well, it's like, who is not going to receive Christ after you've already died, and you have Jesus standing in front of you saying, well, do you want to receive me? <laughs> to go in heaven, you know what I mean? Like, I died for all of your sins. As you're already dead, like, it doesn't make any sense. It's not found in Scripture. It's people that just want to alleviate their responsibility and, and, and try to, to make up, to make themselves feel better that somehow more people are going to heaven than really are. And making up excuses instead of saying, no, God says, the Bible says, you have the ministry of reconciliation. It's your job to preach the gospel to every creature. You are to go to the ends of the world and preach the gospel. But using a similar analogy, think about the guy that says, you know what, I'm sick of all these people and I'm sick of this religion, I'm sick of everything else. I'm going to pick up my family and we're going to move out to somewhere where no one's going to get to us and no one's going to find us. You could say, okay, well, he has the choice to do that. But what about his kids? What about his generation to come? Maybe a few families go out and say, you know, we're just going to go off and, and have our own tribe out in the middle of this jungle and get away from everybody. I don't want anyone bothering us. We're just going to do our own thing, whatever we want to do without anyone else judging us. Well, as a result of their actions, now they could be damning their own children to hell as a result of what they're doing because they're bringing everyone so far away from civilization that maybe no one is going to get the gospel to them right. because they've made it so difficult. I mean, you think about you know, the, the known world or just, just the civilized world in Jesus' day and how far you know, mankind had kind of expanded just over the generations. I don't know exactly how far they've gone, but... Who's to say that some families didn't just go like just just way, way out into the middle of nowhere? They brought that curse on themselves as a result of the father's actions. You could see how the, the what you know parents do can bring down um, a judgment essentially on their children for generations to come. Now let's look at some biblical examples of curses that lasted for generations in the Bible. Turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. And we've covered this story recently with Eli. First Samuel chapter 2, Eli was a pretty good guy. He's the one that, that helped raise Samuel, but his sons were wicked. 
And he did a poor job of parenting and, and would not ultimately hold his children responsible for all the wickedness that they were doing. I mean, they were causing people to hate the, blood, the, the sacrifices that they were giving unto God because they were going in, they were taking the fat, they were stealing stuff basically from God's offerings and, and, and threatening uh, you know, to take everything by force, saying, if you don't give it to us, we're just going to take it from you and there's nothing you can do about it. And they were also committing uh, fornication with, with the women at the, you know, um, that were coming to offer sacrifices and stuff like that. So it was extremely wicked sins that they were doing. And Eli just, you know, he said, oh, you, you guys shouldn't be doing that. And that was it. Like, uh, he basically loved his children more than he loved God. First Samuel 2, look at verse number 27. We'll read through this real briefly. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the cheapest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. So what he's saying is that, you know, I gave your fathers, your forefathers, the people that came before you, this job. And you've resulted it, you know, just through inheritance, through no good of your own, through their, you know, the blessing that I've given them, now you're in this position of being a priest. But he still has a job, an obligation, responsibility, saying, so why is it that you're making yourselves fat off of this? And you love your, you know, you're honoring your children above me. Verse 30, wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. So now we see a curse coming upon Eli and upon his house, upon the, the, you know, his children and upon his descendants to come. He was receiving blessings from God from his uh, forefathers. And now there's going to be a curse as a result of his sin coming upon uh, the people after him. Verse 32, And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation and all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine, whom I shall not cut off from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, and Hophni and Phinehas. And one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices, that I may eat a piece of bread. Turn, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 14. So that's a curse that came down upon Eli's household, upon his descendants, as a result of his own sin and not doing that which is right in the Lord's eyes. 1 Kings 14, we're going to see Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, is another great example of someone who started off receiving blessings from God. He started off as someone that was, hey, you know, I'm taking this away, the kingdom away, from the house of David, essentially. I'm going to leave him a little bit. We'll get into that a little bit later. But you're going to be blessed. You're going to get 10 parts of the kingdom. You're going to have the, the majority of the kingdom just do what's right. But Jeroboam and son of Nebat, of course, he didn't. What did he do? He built the, the golden calves and he, and he put these idols up in two different places and in Dan and, and Beersheba he put up these, these, these idols and caused the, the children of Israel to worship them instead of going down to Jerusalem to worship. And the reason why is because he was worried that the people would reject him from being king if they went down to Jerusalem and saying, oh, you know, we're going to get, we're going to go back under the reign of, of David's lineage. And he was worried about that and didn't have his faith in God to begin with, with, um, with trusting that God had given him the kingdom. But look at uh, 1 Kings 14, verse number 7. 
The Bible reads, Go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel and rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes, but hast done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made the other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and hast cast me behind thy back. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away dung till it be all gone. He that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat, for the Lord hath spoken it. And notice, this is exactly what God was talking about in Exodus chapter 20 and the Ten Commandments. Because what Jeroboam did is he set up other gods. He made graven images and said, These be thy gods, O Israel. And Exodus 20, I'll just reread this for you. It says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. When Jeroboam set up those images and caused the people of Israel to sin in bowing themselves down and worshiping these false gods, he brought about a curse on his own family and on his own house to where they just ended up getting wiped out from, from having a name in Israel. Right. That Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, gone. 1 Kings chapter 21. Look at 1 Kings chapter 21. We'll see another example with Ahab. Ahab is another example of someone who brought a curse down upon his entire family, upon his household, as a result of his own wickedness. 1 Kings chapter 21, verse number 20. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee. Because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee and will take away thy posterity and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebat and like the house of Baasha the son of Ahijah for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. And him that dieth in the field, shall the fowls of the air eat. Notice how similar that is also to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, just those cursings of the dogs eating their, their bodies and stuff. Um, verse number 25, But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things, as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass when Ahab heard those words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. So again, we see the evil is coming from God onto, his genera onto generations following him as a result of his weakness, as a result of him bring, you know, um, worshiping idols and going away from God. God is true to his word, and we need to recognize that the things that we do can have an impact on generations to come, not just even our own life, but just the lives of other people that come after us. Now, we've looked at all the cursing so far. Now I want to switch gears and look at the blessings. Okay, for one, we want to make sure that we're keeping ourselves from wickedness and sins so that we don't curse our own children. I mean, maybe you're angry at God, but do you love your kids? You know, I mean, at least for your kids' sake, don't go off the deep end. Don't turn into some God hater so that you're just going to bring down a curse upon your entire family and that you could love them. But um, let's go beyond the cursings and not worry about that as much. You know, we love God. We want to serve him. Let's see what we can bring about our own children now as a result of loving God and working for God and doing things for God and the blessings that he can give unto generations to come. We see Abraham is a great example. Turn if you would to 1 Kings 11. You're already in 1 Kings. Turn to chapter 11. 
Abraham is an excellent example. Abraham was called the friend of God. Abraham believed God. When God called Abraham, he listened to him. He left everything that he had. He left his family and went into a strange land, not knowing even where he was going. But he was able to walk by faith and do and listen to what God told him to do. And as a result of that, he, you know, God made of him many nations, right? God brought of Abraham the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that was a great promise that God had given unto Abraham as a result of his uh, obedience and his faith in God. So many people have been blessed just through the result of one man. God blessing him, but, but you know what? If Abraham didn't listen to God, if Abraham was just like, yeah, well, I'm kind of more comfortable here at home. I don't want to pick up and move. I'm just going to sit back here. He never would have received those blessings from God. It wouldn't have happened. It was a result of the things they did. Now, of course, God's grace and his mercy you know, is, is not to be overlooked here, but Abraham still had to do something in order to receive those blessings. It's not like God is pouring out those blessings on everybody just for no reason. He's giving blessings on people that actually listen to him. Uh, you're in 1 Kings chapter 11. Look at verse 11. We're going to see here with David and the result of David's adherence to his word. And look, David's a good example too. We, we need to, to remember this because, you know, oftentimes you think of the life of David, you might think of, well, what about when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and murder, right? Those are horrible sins. And they were horrible sins. But you know what's interesting is that that's not how God looked at David's life. He didn't say, oh man, David, you know, it, it, it comes up, it was dealt with, he was punished for it, the result of his actions resulted in the death of, a chi of his child that, that resulted in his adultery. That child died as a result of David's adultery. Again, that wasn't the child's fault, but David's the one that brought that on the child by the wicked sin that he committed. However, even with such a failure, and such a horrible sin because David's heart was right to serve God and he humbled himself in that situation and he continued to move forward and continue to do work for God and to seek God with all of his heart to do that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That's how his life was remembered. That's how God refers to David. That's why when you're going through the, the kings after David and, and when kings do well, they're always compared to David as kind of like a standard. You know, hey, this king did great in all these other areas, but his heart wasn't quite as right as David, his father, their father was. And even with Solomon, look at, look at um, verse number 11 here, 1 Kings 11. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my, co my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding, in thy days I will not do it, look at this, for David thy father's sake. Not for Solomon's sake, not for all the great things that Solomon did, not because Solomon built a temple. He said, I'm not going to do it in your days because of David's sake. Because David, your father, did that which was right so good that I'm still going to have his blessings come out upon you even though Solomon doesn't deserve it at all. The result of his father who did great things for God and had a pure heart towards God still flowed into Solomon's life even after he made altars unto false gods. Now, Solomon's children were still going to go through, you know, suffer punishment for that, for what he did. He says, but I will rend it out of the, the hand of thy son. Verse 13, Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. The impact of one man, of David, upon his household because of how much good that he did and how right his heart was with the Lord is tremendous because Solomon did some, I mean, he was going great for a long time, but his wives turned his heart away from God to where he was building all kinds of false altars to all these various gods, causing all kinds of sin to be committed. Which really isn't that different than what Jeroboam did. When the punishment for Solomon and the entire household could have been completely, it would have been completely wiped out 
had it not been for David's sake, that that blessing, because David followed the Lord so much with his heart, was able to overcome even some of this wickedness for, for generations to come. And this is also inspiring if you are, have been in a situation where maybe you haven't been blessed because of your parents, because of other things that have been done, you know, in your lineage, in your family tree, well, you can still serve God and do what's right. And that's, we're going to get to that actually in just a few minutes here. Uh, one more example of someone who was blessed was Jehu. Uh, the Bible says in second, you don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to second Kings chapter 20. I'm going to read from second Kings chapter 10. Jehu is another one that received blessings from God for generations to come. Uh, verse 30 says, And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. So the actions of Jehu and his, his obedience to God brought a blessing of, you know what, I'm going to let all of your children then be, succeed you as king for four generations to come. And that's a promise from God, and that was the result of Jehu's obedience to God, that God, would, God gave him that blessing. The choices that we make in this life can have a long-lasting impact on the lives of others, even generations to come. Your life has a great meaning. There's a lot of value to what we do here in this life and the, and the influence and the impact that you can have today in this life on, on so many other people and so many people to come. Let's be a blessing to future generations instead of a curse. Amen. But in order for that to happen, we need not to faint. Because look at Solomon's life. He started off great. I mean, he had a great heart. He wanted to serve God. God blessed him. God not only gave him more wisdom than anyone, he gave them all these, you know, the riches and the, and the, and the peace. And, and I mean, he had everything going for him. And he threw it all away at the end of his life. And he's not remembered as being someone that followed God with all of his heart. Even though he did all these great things, at the end, he trashed it. He divided the kingdom up. The result, again, the result of his own actions. The whole nation could have been one. And you think about all of the events that happened afterwards. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Nebat never should have been king. Had Solomon done what was right and not fainted and not given up and not just succumbed to his, his, his stranger wives, you know, getting them to, to build up false, uh, you know, images to, to their false gods. Hey, if he would have just stayed the course, he could have been a huge blessing then even further into, their, into his family. Right. But like I was mentioning, even with a generational curse, individually you can still serve God and you can bring blessings upon your own life even if there's there's these you know repercussions kind of still playing out you can still overcome and gain favor in God's eyes based on your own merit and Josiah is a perfect example of this Josiah is a great example we're going to go through it's kind of like some of the last kings of is of uh, of Judah of, of in Jerusalem before they were taken captive. You have Hezekiah. Hezekiah was regarded as a good king, someone who did that which is right in the eyes of the Lord, but he ended up leaving a curse at the end. He's the one that, that got a disease, and he went to God, you know, and he was told he was going to die, and he said, God, you know, please remember how I followed you. Remember how I did that which was right, God. Help me out, you know, and he sought God. To, to heal him, to cure him. And, and God answered his prayer. He answered his request. Say, okay, you're right. You know, he's like, I'm going to bless you for this. I'll heal you. I'm going to give you 15 more years. And that's exactly what happened. And then Hezekiah ended up showing all of his stuff. You know, when people came to see it. I don't think he gave God the proper glory. And he was kind of just showing off everything that he had. And as a result, he brought a curse now upon his descendants. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 20, look at verse 17. We're going to see what happened there. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. 
Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? And, you know, again, there's, there's an entire sermon right there of how Hezekiah cared more just about himself than about the future generation, saying, Well, well, at least everything's good now. Who cares about the future? Who cares about the future generations bringing this curse upon his own children, upon his gen you know, generations to come? This is so short-sighted, and unfortunately, this is the way that a lot of people kind of look at things today. But we need to make sure that we are living such a life and adhering to God in a way that we can be a blessing to future generations and not bring curses upon them and not have this attitude of like, well, as long as everything's good for me, then I'm good. But overall, still, Hezekiah was viewed as, in general, a good king. And again, when he faltered at the end, and this is why it's so important to maintain our faith all the way to the end. Because anything, you know, the, 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 the things that you accumulate, you know, the, the goodness that you do, you can destroy all of that at the end of your life if you're not, if you're not staying um, true to God's word. So Hezekiah was followed by Manasseh. And Manasseh is extremely wicked king. Look at uh, chapter 21, verse 11 in 2 Kings there. Chapter 21, verse 11 says, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols, therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, look at this, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. Hezekiah was a pretty decent guy, but he didn't care that much about his children. And as a result, Manasseh turned out extremely wicked. And by the way, Manasseh was a child that Hezekiah had after his life was extended. He would not have had Manasseh had he not turned to God and asked him for those extra 15 years. And it's pretty interesting that, that Manasseh wouldn't have even existed. But what Manasseh did in his reign he basically took down everything about the Lord and set up all these groves and images and, and the false gods and, and just worship Baal and even um, did his own child sacrifices and stuff. And he caused all the people to worship Baal. So he was just completely the opposite of, of his father. And um, I think a lot of that has to do with his father not really caring about the next generation and enough to not even care about his own son in the direction that he was going. He didn't raise up his child properly to follow the Lord. So that was Manasseh. And because of Manasseh's wickedness, I mean, God says, you know what? You know what I'm going to do now as a result of how wicked you are and all the wickedness that you wrought in this land? What I'm going to end up doing to Jerusalem and Judah when people hear about it, it's going to make their ears hurt. I mean, they're going to just be like, oh man, I can't believe that that happened to Jerusalem. And it's a, res a direct result of Manasseh and his wickedness. He had a son named Ammon, which was also wicked. And then, but then Josiah. Josiah was a great king. Turn, if you, you're in a, turn to chapter 22 in 2 Kings. I love Josiah. Josiah is a great uh, example I think to believers, he's someone, he's a great example of someone who doesn't have that much going for him. He's not being raised in a godly manner. He's coming from two, you know, his father and his grandfather were extremely wicked. I mean, he's coming just from, from Baal worshiping household now that have brought curses upon him, curses upon Jerusalem, curses upon Judah. Yet Josiah had a good heart and a right heart with the Lord. Look at verse number 18 of 2 Kings 22. The Bible says, But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord. And this is after you know, Josiah hears from the Bible. Here's the word. He's like, oh, man. You know, what, what have we been doing? What have my parents been doing? What has the generation before we been doing? What's going on here? We're, we're cursed of God. He didn't even, because he didn't even realize at that time that they were cursed of God until he heard the words of God. Until he heard from the Bible, he said, oh man, this is really bad. So he sent to inquire and, and just get a word from the Lord, just saying, you know, what's going to happen now, God? Like, like, like I, we see that, this, that what your word says and how, how far we've strayed. We need to correct this. And that's the attitude that Josiah had. And this is the answer that he gets back from God. Verse 18, But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, is touching the words which thou hast heard. 
Because thine heart was tender and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord when thou heardest what I spake against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me. I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. So God still heard Josiah's prayer. He says, you know what? The judgment still has to come. It's going to come. There's been too much wickedness. There's too many things that have happened. I have to bring judgment. But you know what? For your sake, because you humbled yourself, because you recognized, because you, 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 know, you showed yourself sorry and, 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 and your heart was right, I'm going to postpone that during your days. I'm going to make sure that things are going to go well for you and that um, and, and you can receive your own blessing. And the blessing basically is overcoming the curses that, was co that would have been brought upon him because of his, pre you know, his father and his, and his grandfather. So while there are these curses that happen to future generations, you can still have your own say kind of in the matter, right? It doesn't mean things are going to be perfect, but God can still completely bless you for you doing what you're doing, and you can change the course of, of, of the way things have been going within your own family. Look at chapter 23. We'll close with this. Chapter 23, verse 25. 2 Kings 23, 25. I love this about Josiah. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses neither after him arose there any like him not was saying the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him with all our lives matter and they have an impact on generations to come Manasseh's definitely had an impact, but so did Josiah. I mean, Josiah, he, he followed the law of the Lord. He, got, he was getting the Sodomites out of the land then. He was you know, tearing down the, the altars to Baal and just, and just really bringing a revival and, and getting, you know, it said that the, the Passover that they celebrated, he actually did it right. And, and, and I, I preached on this before too, another sermon, but they were supposed to be like staying in booths during the time, and it, and it was a reminder of, of when they were in the wilderness and, and everything else. But like that hadn't been followed just for, for years and years and years and years and years. And who knows if it was ever fully followed. But Josiah, you know, he had his heart right. He said, we're going to do things the Bible way. We're going to get things back to the way that you know, they ought to be and follow to God with all of his heart. And you know what? He individually was blessed as a result of that. Unfortunately, because Manasseh was so extremely wicked, that that judgment still had to come. And, and, and it still had to come upon him. But, but Josiah was able to receive many blessings, I'm sure, and, and earn plenty of rewards in heaven as well as a result of his getting his heart right with God. So we need to value our own life and the time that we have here that God has given to us. Don't just think that Eh, what I do, it's not that big of a deal. You know, we have this attitude, you think of like how many people there are overall in the nation, and you think about politics, and you're like, well, what, who, who cares about my vote? My vote doesn't mean anything. And it doesn't. Your vote doesn't mean anything. I hate to break it to you, but, but it really doesn't mean anything. But that's not the way that things work with God. Right. Your actions actually do mean a lot with him. And, and the amount of work that you do for him and, and, and the, how right you get your heart with the Lord and are willing to be used of God, you can have influence over generations to come by one person doing what's right in God's eyes and God using that person. You can do all kinds. You, you could have a great impact and influence in this world and other people's lives. But don't forget, you can also have that negative influence when you just forsake God, forsake the Bible, start lifting up your own gods, whatever they may be, your own idols, and, and bringing a curse then upon generations to come. There's, you know, our actions are extremely important. What we do here is, is very important in our lives. Let's make sure we, we use our time here wisely. Let's, uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, <coughs> we thank you so much for... Um, 
your word and your instruction, dear God. I pray that you would please help us all to understand you know, a little bit about why things happen and, and the consequences for actions, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to uh, get our hearts right, to be willing to serve you, dear Lord. Give us the strength that we need to endure afflictions and to continue without, um, without faltering, without fainting, that we can leave blessings for generations to come within our own families, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.